Welcome back to part two of the Sony Trinitron consumer set recap. We got a nice huge box from Mauser here. Tons of capacitors. I tried to lay them out and capacitance value into little stacks to make it easier. Uh, here's the board all depopulated and ready to go. I'm not going to show inserting every single one of these, but you get the idea. You watch polarity, check your cap map that you drawn up or that you uh, documented. And yeah, just make sure to place them all with the right values and the right polarity. You can use your service manual as a reference guide as well, but I found a couple discrepancies in there. I think there was a couple that called for 200 microfarad caps and the board actually had 100 microfarad. And there was another instance where a service manual called for a 3000 microfarad and the board had a 2000. So I don't know which information is more up to date, the board or the service manual, but I decided to just put the same values on the board that I pulled out. Altogether, it was about 120 caps that I replaced. I went with all low impedance Nichicons at a 105C temperature rating. Here's a look at them all populated on the board before we solder them in. It was a lot of poking and spreading legs. Oh yeah. Here's the tuner and audio side of the board. Here's the power area deflection area here you can see this cap here I had to lay it down on its side to leave room for that uh, connection there that I believe plugs into the neck board there's one last little look see for all these bad boys get soldered in here you can see those tall boy power filter caps possibly too tall more on that later and now we're ready to flip this board over and get this party started. This is actually the easy part. I like to use this pointed curve tip. I can't remember uh, the, the code designation of it. But uh, it, most people like to use a blunt chisel tip. I like this little curve tip because you can use like the fatter part of the curve for the bigger pads. Or if you need something small and uh, some intricate work done, you can use the very tip of it. It's just a good general all-purpose tip for me anyway. That's what I usually run. I was snipping those legs off. You can get so far and then pads and vias will be blocked by the remaining legs that you've already soldered. So you got to jump back and forth soldering and removing those legs you got to be real careful at the angle that you approach these pads because there's a lot of surface mounted components on this board everywhere just take your time and be careful so I just go back and forth soldering snipping legs off and pretty soon I'm gonna speed this footage up to hyperdrive mode because there was enough soldering and snipping here that it could put a crowd of people to sleep if you're still awake right now thank you here i'm just finishing up that tuner section and uh hyper driving through that audio section There's that jungle chip up there. And last but not least are these two tall boy power filter caps. I ended up pulling them off while I soldered all these on and saved them for last. I bumped the heat up a tiny bit for these because the vias are reinforced. There's a lot of a mass on those vias.
All right, with that main A board finished, we zip through this little V board here. There's a little look see. Here I had to bend these leads to fit the spacing on this button and input board here. Here I switched up my approach on that neck board and inserted one cap at a time and then soldered it in and moved on to the next. There's quite a bit of caps on this little board and it being more of a critical area, I decided to do it one at a time. Here's the part I hate the most, giving everything a bath using 92% isopropyl alcohol. I gotta try out some different fluxes. I'm using a rosin based paste and man that shit's just sticky as hell even after you squirt it down several times. It leaves that nasty sticky residue. It don't come off your hands, it don't come off the board. But it serves its purpose and works well so if you have any suggestions for a different flux, leave a comment. Here we are, all capacitors replaced, popping in that front panel board. There's a look at all the boards completed. And putting these caps in and soldering them sure went a lot quicker than removing them. And here we are getting ready to drop this nice number seven pizza pie combo back in this box get ready for insertion not touchdown fresh you got to go back on the bench those two power filter caps were way too tall and hitting the tube so after much pondering i decided to flip the tube upright and just slide it partially in, connect everything. That way at least I can get some testing and calibration done and see if I destroyed this set, fixed it, or guaranteed the longevity of a crappy geometry tube. Might need your sunglasses for that bald head reflection. Hey pricks, don't you think I would grow some hair if I could? Here's one last look-see of everything connected before I go ahead and plug it in and see what the damage is. Here we are, HD retrovision cables connected to the core graphics with the Super SD System 3 connected. I got a long extendo for the controller up there. I got the remote ready to get in a service menu. All my wires checked. We're ready to power up and give her a test. Luckily, that did not happen. 
power this little girl on. We got some snowstorm static. That's a good sign. Don't worry, that black flickering is just the camera and the frequency not, not in sync. We got video three popping up. Things are looking good. There we go, component input. I was happy to see that. Uh, my geometry went back to crap. I guess it's sitting for a year in the garage or me removing all the capacitors. Uh, it just reset, even though I, I had it tweaked in and saved. So I don't know what the deal with that is. I still got that, that shimmering or that dot crawl or that ringing going on or that H-Sync jitter, whatever the hell you want to call it. This Sony suffers from it. Um, it, it gets worse as I turn the picture or contrast up, but I like it up on this set, so. Here's some Turbo Graphics Bonk's Revenge footage. Looks pretty damn good, but I mean, it looked the same before recap, so I was really hopefully trying to alleviate some of that ringing, but uh, that didn't help, unfortunately. So it was a lot of work, a lot of money. Not a lot, it was about 80 bucks for the cap kit. And all I really did was add to the longevity of this questionable geometry set. But I did learn from it. This was my first CRT recap. And uh, yeah, I learned more about the circuitry in the different areas. And yeah. It wasn't all bad. So here we're in 240p test suite. I got the grid pattern up. You can see that that really bad geometry in the top left corner. And I suspected yoke sag. I've been told yoke sag. So I got that yoke loosened up and I'm just trying to push it up and see if there's any noticeable difference. Um, I got this insulated mechanics glove on. It's probably not doing anything except giving me a false sense of uh, safety. But you get your hand in there, you can feel that static on that yoke while that TV's running. So I felt a little bit more of a safety net with it on, even though it probably didn't do anything. But I get a little more aggressive with this yoke here after I build my confidence up that it's not going to kill me. And just kind of rocking it back and forth as I'm pushing it towards the tube trying to reset it good and I, I've even like I said pushed the bottom of that yoke skirt upwards and with quite a bit of force trying to see if it would alleviate that uh, bad geometry in those corners and it's it really didn't help much so basically this yoke was as good as it was going to get and all the caps were fine everyone tested good so like i said it was a lot of work it was about 80 bucks and really didn't net me anything except some experience but you know what's what's experience worth i mean it's a good way to learn sometimes you just need to jump in there and do it so here i'm in the service menu and this video footage here probably spanned over 30 to 45 minutes but I got it sped up and as you can see I got it adjusted out pretty well I mean this geometry on this set is not gonna be perfect especially on a flat screen uh, I even take a magnet see if I can move down that horizontal bowing at the top but at some point you gotta call it. I mean, you could be in OCD mode messing with this for days. I mean, at some point you gotta say it's good enough and move on. Here we are several days later, my uh, second pair of replacement power filter caps come. You can see the original black one on the far left. Those were 35 millimeters tall. These ones I have installed are 50 millimeters tall and these new ones are 40 millimeters. So hopefully they clear the tube. Now, while I have this board out working on it again, I, I decide to remove resistor 063. Here you can get a 
glimpse of how small it is. And that feeds the jungle chip, the tuner's H sync signal. And I also remove C313, which is the composite signal from the tuner. Underrated made me do it. So here we are, everything back together. The board slid in. As we can see, the TV tuner is completely disabled and it's just saying no signal. So there's no snowstorm static, which is nice. This little mod of disabling the tuner signals from reaching the jungle chip was suggested to me by a guy with an extensive background in CRT repair. And the theory behind it is that the H sync from the tuner, even though that's not the input selected, it can give you some crosstalk and some interference if it's not completely canceled out. So I need to do more testing to see if it's really helped or not. I don't want to say yes, it has or no, it hasn't, but I, I still see it. I just don't know to what extent it's still there. There is probably nothing I can do about it, but it was worth a try while I had the board out. So here we are back in 240p test suite, just looking at that grid again and making sure nothing changed and trying to zoom in and see that H sync jitter or dot crawl or ringing. And here's some horizontal side scrolling, some vertical. It's not the best. I mean, there's geometry issues, but I'm going to put this little clam back in the shell and call this one done. And here we are upstairs set up. Got a Mr. FPGA running through it. It's looking good. It's kind of comparable to that little 1344Q. Um, vibrancy wise, color wise. But, I mean, after you see a PVM, you'll never look at a consumer CRT the same way, at least none of the ones I've seen. Uh, PVM really, really does spoil you and gets your expectations high. But anyway, I have Mr. Outputting RGB signal through uh, VGA to BNC going to the PVM. Then I'm outputting from the PVM RGB through BNC um, going into a VGA adapter into an Audio Authority 9A60 transcoder. It's a VGA to YPBPR component transcoder. Uh, and then I'm going to this 27 inch consumer FS120 with uh, component cables and it worked out good it's looking good um, can't really say for sure if that transcoder is adding any kind of artifacts to it it looks just a tiny hair muddier than than uh, feeding it a raw signal without transcoding it but that could be in my mind too so yeah it was a long repair, a unneeded repair, but in the end, I'm happy with it. I know this crappy geometry CRT will be kicking 20 years from now. And like I said, it was a good learning experience. But fair warning, if you have a FS120 Sony with the jitters, don't always think it needs recapped.